his home after he collapsed in the bath. He had one or two blackouts and was uh, finally diagnosed by a consultant as having epilepsy and being unable to drive a car. So his wife volunteered to fill in this so that he could continue to work, which he did very efficiently. But Fred Shipman hadn't told his colleagues the truth. He was a drug addict with a huge dependency on pethidine, a painkiller used in childbirth. I mean, there wasn't any great disaster or anything. It was just, uh, he, he, he could no longer, he was a sick doctor, wherever he had to go. In February 1976, Harold Frederick Shipman stood in the dock at Halifax Magistrates Court and admitted eight charges of obtaining drugs by deception and asked for 74 other offences to be taken into account. He was fined a total of £600. The court heard he obtained the highly addictive drug by over-prescribing for patients at a local nursing home and by forging prescriptions. Shipman agreed to undergo treatment at the renowned Retreat Hospital in York. Although the General Medical Council was notified, Shipman was not struck off. In 1979, free of his addiction, he applied to join a group practice in Hyde, a small Cheshire market town with a population of 60,000. At his interview, the six partners were impressed by Shipman, particularly his honesty that he had been addicted to pethidine. They decided to give him a second chance. Fred Shipman threw himself into local community life both as a hard-working doctor and as a member of local organisations like the St John Ambulance Brigade, the Scouts and as a local school governor. He soon became so popular that he had a long waiting list of people wanting to join his panel. After almost 12 years he was leaving to go it alone in a single-handed practice and glibly announced he was taking his 3,000 patients with him. The parting was acrimonious, but Shipman didn't care. He'd carefully planned the move for months, and within weeks opened just a few yards away in a converted shop in Market Street. Now, unsupervised, he could enjoy his secret self-indulgence, murder. And as a single-handed general practitioner, he would show them. He would show how good he was and how he could help people. And he would do things his own way. And without the breaks of working in a partnership, um, and the constraints that daily testing yourself against colleagues uh, has on one, um, perhaps that was one of the factors that led to him going off the rails. How seriously Shipman had gone off the rails only became clear when the toxicology results came back from the Forensic Science Laboratory. I'm still amazed that the results that we got back from the forensic examination were as they were. I didn't expect that for one minute. The death certificate issued by Shipman recorded Kathleen Grundy had died of old age. The truth was she'd been killed by a massive dose of morphine. Such an amount that the forensic scientists had no doubt that uh, death would have occurred in quite a short time. She had been to visit him on the previous day to her death at around about four o'clock and he made an appointment with her to go and take a blood sample the following morning. He's made an appointment to kill her. When questioned, Shipman's incredible claim was that Mrs Grundy, at 81, was a heroin addict. What had started as a simple fraud investigation was now a full-scale murder inquiry. Information flooded in from anxious callers to special helplines and detectives began to notice a pattern to the deaths. The number of people that died at home, single women living on their own, dying within an hour or so of seeing Dr. Shipman dying, sat in a chair, dressed in the day clothes. So many of them going to the surgery and dying in the surgery. It just stretched logic 
to uh, something that you could not believe. And right away, we knew that we were probably dealing with one of the biggest murder investigations that one could imagine. But it was Shipman's fascination with computers that was to provide another major breakthrough for the inquiry team and help convict him. Detectives examined the deaths of nearly 150 of his patients. Checks of some of the computerized records of some of the deceased patients revealed that visits that they'd made to the surgery had been obliterated. Things that had been written in about the patient's health had been taken out and we can only surmise that that was done because it didn't uh, correspond with what was on the death certificate. On other occasions, visits appeared on the patient's record when in fact we believed that no visit was made to the surgery. It was as though he was building up a history that would tie in with the medical records that he wrote onto the death certificate. He was certainly uh, covering up his tracks for something. And police computer experts soon discovered what it was. Shipman was altering patient records to conceal his crimes. And on occasion, to save time, he recorded their deaths before he killed them. The number of deaths towards the end were, were increasing at such a rapid rate that I, I sometimes wonder whether he'd have time to prepare a lot of what he was doing and this was why he was changing the medical records round about the time the person died shortly afterwards and in fact in one case he was altering the records before a body was even found. What we decided to do was to go back over a period of 12 months and ascertain how many people had died and how many death certificates that Dr. Shipman had written. In a 12 month period there were some 36 deaths. One of the things that jumped out at us was that never had there been a post-mortem. We also realized that the number of deaths that he had in a 12 month period was two and a half times more than uh, the average. An incident room had been set up at Ashton Underline Police Station, manned by 56 hand picked detectives. Special flow charts were designed showing when, where, how, and under what circumstances patients had died in the previous five years. Our investigations established that. On many, many occasions, Dr. Shipman had seen them on the day that they died. In a lot of cases, he'd seen them within, if not an hour, certainly a couple of hours of death. And again, that itself become illogical. Alice Kitchen was one of those illogical cases, where Shipman had visited shortly before she died. But there was something unusual which bothered her family. All the family were very surprised and wondered why she was sat where she was on the settee because she never sits there. She always sits in a chair where she can see out the window and as soon as anybody pulls up she's got the door open ready for them before they've got to the door. She always sits there and where she was found on the settee she had her back to the window. And um, I do know that one neighbour that was interviewed was asked if she saw Dr Shipman coming or going and she said that um, he was coming out as she was going in her house and that she thought it was unusual that my mother was sat on the settee, she could see the back of her. Uh, and she said that she never sits there and that she always sees everybody to the door and she didn't see him to the door. She thought that was odd. And Dr Shipman never spoke to her, never said she's not well, will you sit with her or anything like that. Alice Kitchen may have died in an unusual chair at home, but five of Dr. Shipman's patients died in an even more unlikely place, his surgery. We spoke to a number of doctors and said, well, you know, how many times have you ever had a patient die in the surgery? And most doctors look aghast. They said, well, it never happens. One of those who died in his surgery was 72-year-old Edith Brady, a long-term patient of Fred Shipman. 
Edith, who loved a social occasion, was the principal guest at the family's Christmas party a few months before her death. He told me that um, she'd gone in the back room to lay down and he just went in and found her dead. And um, that he worked on her and, and nothing could be done. So we spent some time with her. I gave her a kiss and I noticed how tidy she was. And um, they said it was her heart. And we just accepted that that's what it was. And I was just glad that she didn't have to have a postmortem because I didn't want to be messed about. I just said, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad she was there. And he said, well, she's not the first one to die. He had another lady that died in here who said that at the time. And I was glad because that's the place she liked to be. She liked Dr. Shipman. We used to joke about it because we used to say, she's always down there. And I bet he's got fed up with her and bumped her off. And now, now when I think about it, it's unbelievable. Detectives were also noticing other disturbing facts. That Shipman had been present when six of his patients died in one street in an 18-month period. And that in one month, eight women patients died mysteriously. We saw that on one occasion, in a particular month, there were eight people died, which is on average of two a week. And whenever we spoke to other people in the medical profession, that they stood back in amazement. In part three, how Shipman stole from his patients and acquired his means to kill. For a second time, Hyde was overshadowed by mass murder. In the mid-1960s, it was home to Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, the Moore's murderers. Now it was home to Fred Shipman, and as the new investigation grew, once again the population faced the horror of killing. Attending the exhumations of his parishioners, Father Dennis Marr found himself a central figure. The community were in shock. It would be a good way of, of describing it, in shock. They just couldn't believe this was happening. And they didn't want to believe it. It's all a bad dream. On top of this feeling of shock and disbelief and the shattering of trust, people also had a sense of guilt. They had suspicions, but didn't voice them or speak of them for a number of reasons, because at the time they didn't want to upset other members of the family. But a more common factor, who would have believed me anyhow if I said this to any, anybody? Father Dennis vividly remembers Shipman's dismissive manner towards the grieving family of Winnie Miller, only hours after he'd murdered her. Her daughters were in deep shock. I was very shocked myself and very saddened because I was quite fond of Wynne. She was a lovely person. And the doctor came in in a very brusque manner and um, said something along the lines of, you were aware your, your mother had a heart condition. I could see the look of surprise in the daughter's faces. He followed this up by saying she wouldn't accept treatment and she wouldn't go to the hospital. The daughters now were kind of looking in amazement at him. He immediately followed this up by saying, do you have an undertaker? And at this stage I intervened and said, well, the woman has just died and I, I, um, I think I, we just leave that at the moment. He then uh, followed on saying, and by the way, there's no problem um, with issuing a death certificate. I can do I can do that. He just pop down to the surgery. And that was it. He was gone. Knowing what I know now, I can certainly say he was making sure that Nothing would go wrong and that there would be no element of blame in any way attached to him or any suspicion whatsoever. When detectives searched Shipman's home, they found a large number of rings and other jewellery stuffed into a bag in the garage. 
this habit of petty theft from his victims provoked feuds within their families. Various members of the family being questioned as to who got there first and who, who found mum first and so on, and this leading to a kind of suspicions all around the place. I do know also from one family that um, one of the women on the day of her death had been to collect her pension, which would have been in the region of, um, I suppose, 70, 80 pounds. She certainly didn't um, spend all that that afternoon, but no um, money being found in her purse um, after she died. It may never be known how often Shipman emptied the purses of his victims for paltry sums, but from one of them he expected to inherit £60,000. Bianca Pomfret was the youngest of Shipman's victims, only 49 when he killed her. Divorced and suffering from manic depression, Mrs. Pomfret had come to depend on Dr. Shipman. In a nutshell, she thought the world of it to the extent that uh, several years ago we were contemplating moving houses. And, and one of the reasons why we didn't move is, is she stressed that, that she would have preferred to have stayed in Townside and under Dr. Shipman. Now, I think if somebody puts the relationship that they've got with the doctor above moving on to a new form of life, got to be quite a close link. So much so that she informed me several months before her death that, that she was actually leaving all the monies and properties to him in a will. She also stated that she told Dr. Shipman this. Fortunately, I convinced her that the proper thing to do would be to leave her monies and properties to the grandchildren. I can't speculate as to why Shipman murdered Bianca whether or not it was because of the fact that he thought he was going to benefit financially, or maybe even if she had informed him, he realised he'd been cut out of her will. I, I don't know. Bianca Pomfret was the fourth victim to be exhumed. In the following month, police opened eight more graves and removed the bodies for examination. Each body contained varying high levels of morphine. But even without a body, police were able to charge Shipman with the murders of six patients who'd been cremated. So incriminating was the computer and other circumstantial evidence. The evidence that we were being presented with in relation to those bodies where they, they had been cremated was so overwhelming as far as we were concerned that we could not just put it to one side. By now, it was becoming obvious to police that Shipman arrogantly believed he'd created the perfect murder and had got away with it for years. He believed that he was able to face this thing out, that people didn't have uh, a superior enough intellect to break down and establish the facts of what had gone on here. When he was arrested, detectives like Stan Edgerton saw that arrogance at first hand. During the course of questioning, his arrogance was to the fore all the time. Whenever I spoke to him, it was plainly obvious that um, he thought I was beneath him and that uh, he gave a distinct impression that it should be at least the superintendent that was talking to him and dealing with him. And he made that plainly obvious that... Uh, I wasn't uh, his intellectual equal. I think that he, he came in to be interviewed on, uh, on the first occasion on the 7th of September and having walked in through the door he expected to be walking out around about 5 o'clock in the evening. And I think he was surprised when he was charged with murder. You could see his demeanour change, his voice changed. The arrogance was the first thing to go and then to a certain extent he tried then to control the interview by changing the subject or 
trying to indicate to the interviewing officers that they didn't understand. And as we went further into the interviews and we put the forensic evidence towards him, the morphine in the body, he could not in any way explain that. The medical records, um, he couldn't explain again why they'd been changed. Eventually, he got more and more distressed and at one stage actually broke down. But what really shocked hardened detectives like Inspector Edgerton was the ruthless and cynical lengths Shipman went to to obtain his weapon to kill, the morphine. Two years ago, former airline pilot Jim King was wrongly diagnosed with cancer, a week after marrying his American wife, Debbie. After undergoing three months of painful chemotherapy, Shipman was told he'd never had cancer. But Shipman failed to pass on the good news. Instead, Shipman continued to prescribe Jim massive amounts of morphine in order to maintain a regular supply of his murder weapon. He was told on three separate occasions by consultants from different hospitals that I had not had cancer. I had never had cancer. But he still proceeded to do this. I know now why he, why he did this. Because the more patients that you have are uh, terminally ill, the more morphine that you can have in your stock. If you're in general medical practice and you are caring for terminal patients at home, sooner or later you can acquire, you can guarantee that you will acquire uh, heroin which has been unused and which uh, you basically do not have to account for. Jim's father, a shipman patient, was so concerned about his son's health that he started asking questions. Too many for Shipman's liking, and the doctor killed him. My father had been down to the surgery a few times to ask Dr. Shipman what was going on with my case, because he could see me deteriorating rapidly with the amount of morphine I was using. I mean, that son of a gun killed my father on Christmas Eve of all the days to, I mean, uh, to do this. And I believe he did that because he, he needed to stop this man complaining at that time. Because the last thing he needed was to have complaints, knowing that what we know now, the last thing he needed is for somebody to come forward and say, what the hell's going on here? And then all this lot would have come out. And you know, it's a shame it hadn't come out because after he killed my father, he proceeded to kill four or five other, other people. And Shipman would almost certainly still be killing today, but for his amateurish attempt to forge Mrs. Grundy's will. But the big question still remains. Why did a doctor dedicated to saving life murder his patients? Those close to the case have their own theories. He might get a kick out of being in control. And the ultimate power is a power over life and death. Uh, I can't think of anything else that could explain it. Why he did it, I think, is simply a matter of convenience, uh, that it was more convenient, perhaps, to get rid of a patient who was an awkward patient uh, by killing her than uh, by trying to persuade the Family Practitioner Committee to transfer her to another general practitioner. It's horrendous, isn't it, to think of that, that that could happen, but it clearly did. I think that a significant number of the people that Dr. Shipman killed, he may have killed quite simply because he did not wish to continue caring for them for whatever reason. <laughs>